Well, welcome back. <laughs> Lars, how are you doing? So glad you're able to join today. Yeah, Al, I'm doing great. It's uh, great to be with you. And uh, thanks to everybody uh, tuning in from wherever you're tuning in around the world. Yeah. And yeah, here we are. I'm so you know, not only excited to be talking with you, but it's, some, you know, we've started to work more closely together and I'm learning more about not only you, but what you have been doing with your cohort. Obviously your book is doing well and I feel privileged to have been a, a minor contributor to that. Get, just if you would, for those uh, who don't know Lars and what you do, uh, provide an introduction and what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, um, let's say I'm, I'm Lars. I am a, uh, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a, a tinkerer uh, with, the, with the deep curiosity set. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of my career in corporate running uh, talent and recruiting teams at Ticketmaster, uh, Magento, and NPR. And then I've been doing entrepreneurial stuff over the last you know seven and a half years through um, my primary company, Amplify. Uh, and then the new redefining HR accelerator uh, that I just launched. So I have kind of this, you know, media element wrapped around the core work um, for uh, I write for a fast company. Uh, as you mentioned, just published my second book. Um, I host a podcast called Redefining HR. So really, kind of at my core, I'm I'm super uh, curious about the evolving kind of field of HR and people operations. And then from a personal kind of mission standpoint. Uh, you know, really, you can sum me up. The projects that I get involved with are all aimed at kind of accelerating the evolution uh, of the field of HR at scale. So that kind of um, that's the barometer for the kind of projects that I get involved with. Well, you know, when we talk about redefining HR and you know people operations, you know, there's obviously a purpose, you know, to HR. You know, yeah. it, and it has been shifting, particularly with COVID. Uh, there's been a heightened uh, focus on employee well-being, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, with the anniversary of the death of George Floyd a couple of days ago, you know, has rightly elevated in terms of priority and uh, uh, prominence in, in the mindset of leaders as well as organizations. So, in terms of why redefine HR? You know, yeah. what, what, you know, why, why, why do we need to re redefine it? How about you know, we start there? Yeah, I, I think, uh, so I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I think when you look at the, the term HR, I think a lot of people, when they first heard the title of the book uh, and they heard, you know, the podcast changing, um, they, they thought it was, you know, a very simple kind of, oh, okay, like moving from HR to people ops or like talent culture or people mm -hmm. in places or, Human capital, don't be human capital, but, uh, but uh, yeah. I think there's other examples, right? And I'm like, it can be that, but it's more than that. Like, I think when you, when you look at um, the perceptions of HR, like oftentimes all of HR is painted with this broad brush uh, and, and often that brush is, is more or less rooted in legacy perceptions of the function. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I had the pleasure, as do you, you know, we, we are able to operate and have these global networks of people that are doing really innovative work and have been pushing the boundaries of, of the field for years. Um, they've never self-identified with those kind of stereotypes or perceptions. Like when you're like, oh, personnel and transactional and legacy, they're like, no, not in my world. Like I haven't right. experienced that. And, and me kind of going back to my practitioner days, I, I was had the pleasure of working for incredible leaders and progressive environments. So like I never identified with that world and that brush that people try to paint all of us with. And so right. for me, redefining, it's about taking control of our narrative. It's mm -hmm. about saying like, Hey, that's, I, that's, you know, what you're describing doesn't apply to how I work and the impact that I bring to my business and my executives and my team, mm -hmm. we're building something different. And so I think, you know, it, you know, it, whether you call yourself, HR, people ops, or whatever else, it's, it's more oriented around how you think, how you operate, and the impact you work to bring to the business. That's kind of the redefining HR. It's like, like let's, you know, we're going to build our own, um, mm -hmm. you know, perception within the field. Um, you know, don't, don't put us in those, those corners that uh, don't all apply to our world. Yeah, you know, as, you, as you're talking, you know, I believe it was Fast Company, you know, what, what, why we hate HR came out, I don't know, it was 12, 15 years ago. I mean, it was, yeah. it was and you know, HR obviously has a brand and some have tried to change that brand within their organization, yet there's a lot of inertia on that. 
you know, and there's a lot of kind of, oh, you know, roll their eyes, HR, you know, don't they just do comp and, and Ben? And some have changed the naming convention entirely, to your point, you know, you're calling an employee experience, employee success. So you, what are your thoughts there about branding the function? You know, should we be open to changing or should we, you know, just embrace HR and move forward with uh, what we got? I'm just gonna hope you heard the question. <laughs> Did you hear the question? I, I'm not getting, I, I got to, I got halfway through and then I lost it. Uh, for, for, no. <laughs> Al and I were joking about this earlier for listeners yeah. review. We had some storms come through last night and uh, internet connectivity is uh, for some reason uh, spotty today, which is not fun. But uh, yeah, if you could jump back in the back half of that, uh, I'd appreciate that. Well, the, the essence is this, is that HR has a, a brand. And yeah. you know, why we hate HR was 12, 15 years ago, the article on Fast Company. And the uh, you know, some organizations have stayed with that naming convention and tried yeah. to reframe it. Others have just bailed on the whole naming convention entirely and called themselves um, employee success or employee experience yeah. or, or what have you, you know, what would you advocate? Um, you know, I, I like personally, and it's personal preference, right? I think this is one of those things where I'm not saying this is what you should be called because really yeah. it's, again, it's the impact, not the name. I, I lean towards either people operations or talent and culture. Um, I, I think both those, I, I'm also intrigued by employee experience, you know, because I think that you, it's, it's funny, like we use these terms uh, but these terms have different meanings depending on how we use them. Like there are some people mm -hmm. who, you know, view employee experience as a subset of HR and people operations. There's some people, you know, like Steve Levy, who's one of the founders uh, of the term uh, employee experience, who view that as the function. Uh, right. It's like it, it, it's mm -hmm. it's it's all of it. And so, um, you know, for me, I think that uh, those those names uh, connect with me a little bit more. I think it kind of sets an expectation of what we do. Like there's something inhuman to me about the term human resources, right? It's just like, you know, it's kind of like human capital. It's just like, yeah. uh, but again, I don't, I don't hate it. If that's what you want your team to be, that's fine. But uh, it is interesting. Like I remember even last year, I interviewed um, the chief people officer at uh, MasterCard, Michael Fricaro, mm -hmm. and he was in the process then of, you know, his title had just changed mm -hmm. from CHRO to chief people officer, and his team was being kind of renamed or rebranded. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you often hear that term in kind of the tech uh, and, you know, venture-backed ecosystem, but I think that, that it's jumping from that to kind of enterprise companies as well. Yeah, I... <laughs> Yeah, I have, when we talk about human-centered design, you know, yeah. that sounds like really cool, right? And yeah. when you hear human resources, it sounds a lot less cool. <laughs> and you know, I'm really interested as we have a new generation of HR leaders, there I go with HR, um, you know, coming in, are we going to see a shift because perception matters, right? When you're yeah. trying to uproot a whole line of thinking that has been reinforced over the past 40, 50 years, you know, that's a, by definition a heavy lift. And unless you're an agile, up and coming AO you know, company, you know, there's just a lot of, you know, stuff to unpack and and remove and and reframe. So my my question here. You know, I look at HR increasingly as a facilitator as opposed to an owner of processes, particularly at, with COVID and this um, focus on remote work, on, on well-being, you know, creating inclusive environments, as, as we talked about. You know, who is the owner of these processes? You know, is it HR itself or is it you know, the business. So as we talk about the advancement of the function, no matter what we call it, you know, how do you see HR, you know, functioning? Is it, you know, the owner of these processes or is it more of a facilitator? Yeah, you know, it's I, I love the point that you make. Uh, and I agree with it, actually. I think one of the biggest shifts from kind of legacy HR to modern HR is moving from these command and control structures to decentralize and empower. You know, that's kind of a framework that I, I laid out in the book. And the idea behind that is, is I think in the past, 
you know, HR, um, you know, again, going back to those legacy organizations, we had a bit of an insecurity problem. And we felt, uh, you know, we always talk about seat at the table, seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And we had this view that uh, if we created, uh, you know, dense process through which things flowed through HR to happen, that was like, a, that gatekeeper spot was like a, a position of power. It got us, you know, more clout and credibility. Um, but the opposite happened. Like it pissed mm -hmm. off our employees. It created unnecessary bureaucracy. It cost us credibility with leadership. And so I think if you look towards those modern organizations, you know, they're all about decentralizing and, empower, decentralizing and empower. It's about creating frameworks and processes and systems that allow employees and managers to do their work. It's not about unnecessarily inserting yourself into something just for the sake of being there. It's not about creating process for the sake of process. Like that's that's bureaucracy, it's policy cops, it's all these kind of negative connotations of HR's past that I think we haven't you know, shaken yet. And so um, to me, I think our role is really uh, an architect and a guide, you know, we, but, but we, can't, we can't have the burden on us to own. So you mentioned topics like DEI. HR can't own DEI if you want DEI to be successful. Culture. HR can't own culture if you want to build a thriving culture. Um, and so even the shifts towards remote, a lot of that is, you know, CIO or the systems that allow our employees to do their best work. Um, I'm rooting for him, <laughs> Emmanuel. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your your, your comments. Let me. Um, we heard most of that, Lars. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think we lost that best uh, work. Yeah. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll march on. We'll, we'll march on. It's not too disruptive yet. <laughs> all right. All right. But now, there, yeah. it was a solid gold answer, so I'll have to. Uh, I'll it it was. <laughs> it, it was. We got ninety percent of it. All uh, right, it, right. it. I just want to toggle. So, um, you know, Emmanuel has uh, had some uh, comments here, and I find it uh, fantastic that someone else is using this term, and you know, this notion of facilitator. And I, I'm going to talk about workforce planning. Um, workforce planning is something that has been ill-defined for a, a long time. And what I want to focus on is this notion of capacity. Yeah. So there's a lot of skills-based work, and we'll talk about you know, you know development and identification of proper skills and the recruiting and selection process. But really this notion that we're all limited by time and that we need to find the right size of the workforce. I interviewed a Rob Cross yesterday who's doing fantastic work on uh, the offset of performance and well-being. You know, again, we can only do so much. We can only produce so much and still maintain well-being. So if we're optimizing for that over a workforce, we have a certain total capacity. Oftentimes that total capacity is less than what leaders need to actually execute a strategy. So I, it's my hope that HR takes a more assertive, data-driven uh, position and role in facilitating insight into, hey, this is our capacity, this is what we need to do to get to the, kind of right size the workforce and be creative in leveraging outsource providers, contractors, consultants, AI, and, and other things. So again, the focus question is workforce planning in helping organizational leaders identify capacity constraints and plan accordingly. You know, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, no, I think you're you're spot on. I mean, we have, you know, we meaning kind of the the modern sophisticated HR teams, you know, we have incredible amounts of data at our disposal that can actually help us validate those assumptions. Like there are assumptions we've probably had for years, right? As, as it relates to workforce and we're kind of overburdening our employees. Um, but we didn't always um, have the data or we didn't know how to interpret the data. And that piece is changing where I think now we can make a much more compelling case to leadership 
uh, around like how we need to observe when we're hitting that stress point. Um, and also factoring in everybody's pretty stressed, like right now, like everybody has, you know, has hit limits, has passed limits. And, and, you know, we're, we're, we're coming out of an environment where this has been anything but normal going through the pandemic. So we have the work stresses coupled with life stresses, family stresses, so many other factors that are all compounded um, that, uh, that, that make a difference. And so I think that you are seeing those kind of best in class teams be able to proactively identify when that capacity is kind of nearing a cap uh, and, and being proactive about coming to the executive team to develop alternate plans uh, like you said, whether it's, you know, bringing in consultants, you know, redeploying the workforce, uh, uh, you know, deprioritizing some projects for others um, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're not kind of running everybody at a 10 out of 10 for a long period of time. Right. You know, there's so much that I would hope for our discipline, you know, moving forward, yet there are you know, barriers to making this happen, barriers to redefining HR. What are some of the key ones that you see? Yeah, I think one of the biggest barriers is leadership, to be honest. And I don't mean HR leadership. I mean, you know, CEOs, executive leaders, board, um, you know, you, I kind of look at the field of HR as a spectrum, right? Where you have, uh, you know, there's maybe 10% are at that leading edge, best in class in all the ways they do all the things that we're talking about. And, you know, you obviously you have a, a massive global community of uh, people, analytics experts. Most of them are probably in that 10%. The other end of that spectrum is probably 20%. That's more of the legacy oriented kind of personnel transactional, but about 70% are in the middle. And a lot of those people aspire to build the capabilities that top 10% possesses, but they have blockers in their way that aren't necessarily their, you know, interest, skills, desires, or proficiency. Uh, and oftentimes as blockers from leadership, or maybe it's an executive who has never had, uh, a, a, you know, a, a proactive kind of modern HR and people team, and they don't know what that looks like. They don't know how to resource it. They don't know mm -hmm. how to support it. And so, you know, you you could be the most innovative, progressive, you know, proactive people executive in the world. But if you're working for one of those CEI, CEOs, you're going to be capped. There's only so much you're going to be able to do. And so I think that that tends to be a blocker. Um, I think a historical blocker that we're seeing less and less of now is that the field of HR historically has been pretty black box about, you know, our programs and our practices and mm -hmm. our resources. And, you know, we weren't great at sharing that. We hoarded it as proprietary knowledge as if, you know, uh, you know, HR was a zero sum game and, you know, other people had advantage. It means our disadvantage. And like that legacy thinking likely is largely out of the field now. I think many more people are embracing open source collaboration, sharing of practices and the access to those ideas and templates and mm -hmm. practices and, and like mistakes, right? I think people are also being more comfortable with like, hey, we tried this thing and wow, it was horrible. Like we totally screwed this up because we yeah. did X, Y, or Z. And they're willing to, to share that and be, you know, humble about it. Um, now I think other practitioners who are looking to do that kind of stuff, they can be like, oh, you know what? Um, yeah, I did look at that. Like a great example, going back to HR open source, um, you know, probably 2017, uh, we were working with SoundCloud on a case study on them building a, a global people dashboard. And uh, they, they it became pretty slick, but they spent about a year building it and they didn't run it through their security and compliance team. Uh, and so they were just getting ready to launch it and they looped them in at the end and they said, none of this will work. Um, wow. none, of this, none of this is combined. You have to blow it all up and rebuild it from scratch. They spent a year building yeah. it and they had to redo the whole thing. So I think that that sort of thing uh, now where you can see, oh, you know, now if somebody else is looking to do something similar to what SoundCloud did, they'd like, oh yeah, we better like loop those stakeholders in early uh, just to make sure what we're building is uh, is compliant. Yeah, th thank you for that story. Uh, you know, by the way, I didn't share this at the outset. Um, you're participating here. Uh, you can go ask questions and uh, enter comments in the chat section over here. I'll do my best to um, field those for Lars. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to share is this, is that we um, have so much potential um, given where we are. And I love what you shared about this uh, idea of um, 
leaders being more aware of what HR can do. That goes back to what we were talking about before is like redefining effectively marketing our capability to, to a greater extent. Uh, but when we talk about this potential, we can't do it alone. We need new governance models. And I'm echoing what uh, McKinsey was talking about, Willow Towers Watson, uh, Josh Burst, and many others before the pandemic, is that we need new ways to run our business because we have this hierarchical structure that's function, you know, siloed, you know, we've been doing that for 50, 60, 70 years in the wake of World War II was, was the way we modeled organizations. And here we are in the digital age, things are moving really fast. And to your example with SoundCloud, it's like, how are we going to create this collaboration where we're going to reduce risk and increase the likelihood that not only we do the right thing, but we're in turn taking the appropriate action on the back end of it? You know, so that goes back to this notion of facilitation. So my question for you, you know, what is, do you think about repositioning HR or whatever we're calling it within a new management structure, a new way of formulating not only people strategy, but work strategy, how work gets done. Yeah. I mean, look, this is, um, this is such an exciting time for the field, uh, the field of HR kind of broadly. Um, you know, we're, 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 you know, the pandemic has been a massive forcing function uh, to push us into what was once kind of uncomfortable concepts of the future of work, right? There's no more future. Mm -hmm. Like we're we're here, we're doing this stuff now, and we have this rare opportunity to build a new based on today. And I don't I don't say that lightly, meaning like oh it's just easy, everybody can just blow up all their stuff and <laughs> build for new. Like right. not one company is necessarily going to do that, right. but. Like a lot of these, a lot of the way that we've always done things are just rooted in legacy. These kind of industrial age concepts of what it means to work, right? Like work has to be in an office. Work has to be nine to five. Work has to be, uh, you know, five days a week. Um, and we know none of those things are necessarily true now. Like they, it, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. You can be productive with constructs that don't fit into those three boxes. And so I think for us in HR, like we, we have to kind of seize this moment. My, my biggest fear is that we, um, you know, we let, and in some cases, you know, CEOs are driving for this, uh, this uh, inertia to return to a past that no longer exists. Right, February of 2020, the li life, work, everything as we know it at that time, that no longer exists. Like that's mm -hmm. changed, and so I think we have to resist the urges to just get everybody back in the office, to just you know, uh, you know, revert everything back to the way things were then. That's going to be a huge missed opportunity um, for all of us. So I think it's important that HR leaders take this time to really work with their business and and be really thoughtful about how they're designing these new, more kind of agile work constructs, as opposed to, um, again, just saying like, okay, uh, hybrid means exactly this. You know, I think the key right now isn't, it's not really whether it's hybrid or co-located or remote, it's flexible. Mm -hmm. It's having a range of constructs that employees and teams can fit into based on what works for them. I think the companies mm -hmm. that, that come out of this just on fire, there, you know, it's not going to be because, you know, they committed to hybrid, like full out or they committed to remote. It's going to be like they were flexible and they were thoughtful and they listened uh, and, and they really kind of uh, thoughtfully designed a plan that works for their employees, for their managers, for the business. Uh, and it's something that they're continuing to tweak and iterate mm -hmm. on because like yeah. the plan you land on today isn't necessarily going to be the best plan six months from now. So you have to have some fluidity in that. And that's, that's a big challenge for HR. I mean, we're historically a group that loves playbooks, uh, you know, and loves kind of set ways of doing things. And we're entering this new frontier where it's like, it's nimble and it's agile and uh, yeah, things are not just carved in stone. I'm so glad you landed on that notion because I am a hundred percent agreement. And I'm also going to take that reality and toggle a little bit because we have focused in the discussion thus far on effectively leadership, CHROs, branding the function, even CEOs and how they perceive HR. If I am a 
people manager, if I am a HR business partner or a COE lead within HR, I'm not calling the shots across the board. You know, I have to redefine HR arguably within my sphere of influence. So what would you say to those who, you know, aren't in charge of redefining the whole function that have to deal with, you know, certain realities within their organization, yet they still want to to innovate? Any coaching or ideas there? Yeah. I mean, redefining HR doesn't have to be a macro event. Uh, right. Oftentimes it's not. I mean, we have to be honest about that. Like, I think it could be a, a, a progressive department within a less progressive overall team. And so for one, like, don't let the fact that you're not in that top job, um, you know, limit you from trying to push the boundaries. I think the most important thing I would say to somebody in that position is, you know, even if you're in an environment that's a legacy environment and they're not willing to take chances, they're not willing to do different things. As an individual, it's your responsibility to yourself personally, not as an employee, but as an individual, as somebody who has a, a full career they have to consider to make sure that you're exposing yourself to those practices, to those ideas, to those concepts, yeah. even if they're things that you can't necessarily implement in your own organization, it doesn't abdicate your, you know, ability or, or responsibility to know what they are and to be mm -hmm. curious about them. And so I think that, that that's a big piece. And then um, my favorite word when it comes to innovation is, is piloting. Uh, you know, you, you will uh, rarely mm -hmm. in those environments where you get the green light to just overhaul everything. So don't try say, I'm just going to do We'll do a little bit of AB testing. I'm going to, I'm going to try this different process with this subset. Let's try this and see how that works. And if it works, scale it, if it doesn't blow it up and learn, learn from it. And move on. But I think you're mm -hmm. you're still in power. Don't let the ability or the fact that you're not in that top job, um, you know, limit your your ability to make an impact both within your role, but certainly within yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lo really love what you're sharing because I I couldn't agree more. This is uh, it rarely is it going to be the case where you have a new CHRO come in or chief people officer, what we call them. <laughs> And then all of a sudden they wave a wand and, you know, everything's different and you have the space to to move and innovate in, in ways that we're talking about. It is going to take uh, some incremental changes at all levels, uh, both within HR and the receptivity, you know, outside, uh, you know, of HR. So with that you know, in mind, let's go to the book. Uh, you spent obviously some time <laughs> putting this together and that's a heavy lift and kudos to you for getting over the finish line, getting it published. What are some of the key learnings that you had in going through that journey of you know, putting it together? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it, it was an interesting uh, experience to write a book in, in a global pandemic. I mean, I think, uh, it, but it, you know, in hindsight, super fortunate. Uh, of the timing because I was able to write a book that reflected our reality now, mm -hmm. not the reality, you know, in February, 2020 or beyond, which, you know, it's just a very different reality now as I don't need to describe to anybody watching right now. Um, but it was, it was a great experience. Like I, uh, I was able to take in a lot of the conversations I've had through um, some of the podcasts, uh, interviews, research, um, and, and really kind of bring that to life. Like my, my driver in writing the book, I've been covering, you know, modern work practices uh, and approaches for years through Fast Company and through my podcast and, um, you know, conferences and things like that. But I, I, I realized after doing that for a couple of years that it's like, individually, this, is an, this, this holds up and it's an interesting piece, but it's a, a very small uh, you know, drip in the ocean of change that's happening. And it's not necessarily connected to all these other thoughts. And so I really wanted like the driver behind the book is I wanted to write something that brought all it all together. It was kind of a, a cohesive story and a connected story around what HR can look like at our best uh, and, and have that be kind of a call to action for the field um, for, uh, you know, just representing. Cause you know, I, I'm somebody, as I mentioned, like I, I've always grown up in, in progressive HR teams. I've always loved the field and admire the work that we do. It's not easy, uh, but it's important and it matters. And so, you know, the book for me was a way to kind of say, oh, look, here's, you know, uh, a, a blueprint for what great HR can look like. And most importantly um, is that the book doesn't center on me. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, you know, there's lots of, um, 
academic or analyst or other takes on on HR from people that are pretty far removed from the day-to-day -day of, of the work. And like, I mm -hmm. haven't sat in a practitioner's seat for seven years. I'm one of those people. And so mm -hmm. even though I'm deeply connected to all of them, I don't sit in that seat. And so, you know, it was really important for me to, to center lots of other voices and stories and, you know, essays and case studies from practitioners who are actually in that seat doing that work because I wanted the, like I kind of lay the foundation for, hey, here's how modern teams are thinking about X, but now let me bring in tangible examples of companies doing that so that uh, readers can, you know, it's just more relatable. It's not like, well, here's Lars's opinion on a bunch of stuff. Like it is that, but it's also married with like, okay, here's what it actually looks like in practice. Yeah, I, I love it. And uh, number one, I enjoyed it a lot. And I think it's immensely useful, uh, not only with ideas, but practical steps. And that's, you know, something that I think is uncommon. And the timing, to your point, I think is really spot on. And you, when we talk about branding, you've in effect, rebranded yourself and you know what you're doing, and now you're running a cohort. Can you provide some insight as to why you rebranded and you touched on it earlier, and a little bit about your cohorts? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. Like I, I was um, our mutual friend uh, Jennifer McClure. I was on her podcast earlier this year, and she was like, you know, you since I've been following you, like you were like a corporate recruiting and branding guy at NPR. You know, and then you were like a branding and consultant guy, and then you were this HR open source guy, and now you're this. And I was like, yeah, that's true. Like I, I've always, um, my my interest and my passion and my curiosity kind of guides where I go. I don't get locked into like, I'm a recruiting guy, that's my box, I have to just do that. Or I'm an employer branding guy and I have to just do that. And so for me, it was like, looking back the evolution to where I am today, and then I'll answer your question specifically, it was like, the, the Fast Company series led to the podcast. The podcast led to the book. The book led to this new accelerator platform. And part of it is based on feedback from the book. Like I'd have a lot of people who read the book and then came back to me and be like, look, I, you know, the book resonated with me. Uh, I, I want to adopt those kinds of practices. Um, where can I learn to do that? And I didn't have a great answer, to be honest with you. I was, I mean, I can say like, you know, like for, for people, I for like segments within it. So like for people analytics, go to Al, you know, for, mm -hmm. for diversity and inclusion, go to this person. But like, I didn't have a, a collective place to say, uh, you know, th this is where you'll learn fundamentals of modern HR because the existing platforms out there, from my perspective, um, you know, they just didn't offer that. They weren't, they weren't equipped to kind of keep up pace with the modern practices. And so that's really where the idea behind the accelerator came from is I wanted to kind of extend the platform that started with the the book and the podcast and then uh, add a couple additional channels. You know, one is um, the cohort program, as you mentioned, which is, you know, a four week uh, program for um, either existing or aspiring CPOs, heads of people, CHROs, uh, where I can run them through like a pretty in-depth set of uh, of synchronous and asynchronous learning because it's designed for people who are working now and obviously bandwidth is you know at a minimum uh and then bring in you know world-class guest instructors to help educate them on different fields that are fundamental to modern hr like al adamson for people <laughs> analytics and you know <laughs> tiffany stevenson at uh, patreon for diversity and you know caitlin holloway for leadership aj thomas over at uh, x the google's moonshot factory so you know it was really this this um incredible way to combine my own experience my own background and my own network but really uh, uh bring like an intensive learning program um together for um for for hr modern hr leaders and then the other components are on-demand courses. So I plan on building those over time. Um, and then next month I'll be launching the next channel, which will be a, a newsletter and community bundle. Really all of these things complementary, uh, aimed at helping build kind of capabilities and competency and connections. So network is, you know, community is gonna be woven into everything we do um, for modern HR operators. Uh, yeah, I love the model that you've created and uh, I feel honored to have contributed and uh, look forward to doing so ongoing and, and vice versa, I hope. Uh, I want to just talk, Amy, I, I want to be very sensitive, but 
you know, it's something that I celebrate because I don't want to seem self-serving that we're selling something here. Uh, that being said, how people learn is something that both you and I have been very curious about for a long time. I mean, I think most people are. And uh, Don Tapscott years ago talked about that we're in the age of networked intelligence and that it's really <clears throat> about how we can access information quickly and take action on that information. And I have had the good fortune of running and facilitating peer groups in a community for 15 years plus now. And it's taken different forms like you, you shared, but ultimately we learn from each other um, probably more, you know, in the stories and ideas than any other you know, forum. And particularly with uh, remote work and the pandemic, you know, we've had to do that virtually, but there's nothing like getting in the room with a group of peers, sharing ideas, listening to theirs, iterating, and not only, you know, cognitively developing, but getting that energy and, and, and that, you know, inspiration. So I see that, you know, that's what you're offering up and, and delivering. So I, uh, two, two quick things, um, and then I'm going to put this in a question. Uh, Aaron Hurst, the Purpose Economy back here, uh, interviewed him uh, late last year. I mean, he has, has an organization called Imperative right now, and effectively it uh, brings peers together, and it helps them do that in, in, in real time uh, in the flow of work. And it's really exciting to, to see those kind of tools take heart. It, it addresses diversity, equity, and inclusion. It facilitates innovation, all this cool stuff. So um, I want to highlight that. On the other side is that once we have, if you're probably familiar with Dunbar's number, um, 150, you know, that was research done years and years ago, that that's how many relationships we as humans can manage at any one time. Now, the number has likely shifted up or down, depending on stage of life, to where you are in your career, and a variety of other, you know, variables. However, we're in this place now with all these devices and platforms in which we can get overloaded. And yesterday I interviewed Rob Cross once again, who's the author of Collaboration Overload. And he wrote an HBR article, has a book coming out on the topic. So there's diminishing uh, returns to networked intelligence and and just general you know networks. So what I'm hearing that you have done is, is a really focused group, a focused experience where it's not going to be overload. It's going to be something that is immediately relevant, immediately actionable. And that, in my view, is not only a very evolved way to learn, but it's really going to be the way we're going to be learning in the future. So yeah. is that what your thinking and rationale is behind this or am I overthinking? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, you're, no, that's uh, you're, what, what do you overthink things? Um, no, I think, uh, we'll call it thorough you're, thinking. Yeah. You're, you're, okay. I like that. I like that. Uh, no, I think you're spot on and I'll probably even kind of uh, go a little deeper in one area. Like to me, and I've built a range of communities. I've been members of a member of dozens of communities. I am a member of dozens of communities. So I, I have this unique vantage point where like, I've seen lots of what works. I've seen what doesn't work. I've built things that worked. I've built things that don't work. Um, and to me, I think when I assess the landscape now, and this is a big kind of driver for me in creating the accelerator community is because there are so many platforms out there and there's never been a better time to be a practitioner in terms of like, there's so many things out there, right? There's like, you yeah. know, free things, paid things, member things, uh, you know, so whatever it is you're into, there's a place for you. What I found in both participating and assessing a lot of those things is that um, they, they tend to be digital homes for questions. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of them have a very kind of default Q&A lean. Like you go there, it, it's, it's, it's more of a utility platform than a real community. So like if I'm struggling with exit work, 
I go mm -hmm. to this place, whether it's Facebook group, Slack, whatever else, um, I ask my question. If it's an engaged community, I'll get a couple of responses. That can happen via email. Like it doesn't have to be an online platform. Uh, it can be as simple as email. Uh, but usually I get my questions and then I go away and it helps me and it's additive to me. So I'm not diminishing the value of those things. Mm. But I, I, sometimes I feel like, like it's not necessarily, it's hard to create a space where people feel they belong in an environment that is more transactionally oriented. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm doing uh, is my intent, and I'm in the early days, so I can't say I've done this, uh, but my intent as I build the accelerator community is to build a destination. I wanna create a space where people uh, feel that they belong, where actually people want to hang out beyond the question. So it's not just like, yes, it will have that. I'm stuck doing X. Has anybody done this? I'm looking for a tool that does Y. Does anybody have a recommendation? Sure. Like everybody does that. We'll do that too. But I want to also create a space where when I have some time in between meetings, I'm just going to pop in there and hang out. And the, I'm using a tool. Uh, I'm just getting ready to, I'll be launching this broadly. I'm piloting it right now uh, called Geneva. And it's a new community kind of specific platform designed particularly around this use case, because I think a lot of the ways that we interact now, it's like, uh, you know, Slack isn't designed to be that, but many mm -hmm. of us are using it for that. Facebook groups isn't designed to be that. Many of us are using it for that. Email certainly isn't designed for that. Right. Many of us are using it for that. But this platform has, you know, chat capabilities. It has an always on video room where people can just jump into and hang out. It, you know, similar to Clubhouse, it has an audio room where people can come in and they can just hang out and have a chat. And so, no. you know, I want to be really thoughtful and deliberate around creating a space where people that's, that's a destination, you know, to spend time and to build those relationships beyond like this person had a helpful answer to my question. Cool. Like there's value in that, but like, I want you to be able to say, Hey, let's, you know, I haven't actually met you. Like I'm, I'm in London. Uh, I, I saw you're in, you know, Sydney, um, you know, if the time zones work, let's pop over to this video room and just hang out and having like set office hours where like for an hour a week, the video room is just open and anybody mm -hmm. who's free and wants to come hang out can do so. So that, that, that to me is kind of what I feel is missing. And a lot of those platforms are out there. Um, and that's what I aspire to create, uh, with the accelerator. That's, that's awesome and inspiring. And as you're sharing this, it's, it's, uh, it's inspiring thinking for me is as to why organizations themselves don't do this, you know, because organizations are by definition are groups of people or arguably a community of people who are focused on a, an aligned mission. So do you see a, a future where, you know, organizations have physical locations, certainly where they, you know, interact, but they also have these platforms that facilitate interactions across, you know, time zones and functions and so forth? Yeah. I mean, the smart ones will. Yeah. Is it, look, our, our workforce has changed. We we will yeah. have some people who will are dying to get back in office and they will be as soon as it's safe. We have some people who will never be back in office. And so I think for most of us, you know, at least for the next five years, as we kind of evaluate the model, hybrid is kind of our default. And so, you know, lots of organizations talk about the struggle of maintaining and building and strengthening culture in a hybrid or distributed environment, um, you know, that can be real if you're not thoughtful about designing programs to account for that. And so mm -hmm. having a community, you know, it's interesting, like the, the concept of community is far from new, from new as, as you know, but I think the way that we're thinking about being intentional around community is something that you're seeing in these peer groups. Um, you're seeing brands, you know, brands are taking a much more active role of building communities beyond like a message board on their product, but like really building, incentivizing, like it is, it's, it is an art and it is a business uh, additive feature to have like a vibrant community of people that you can, of your customers who you can talk to directly, uh, right? In a channel that you own, you know, not necessarily Twitter or somewhere else where, you know, you, you have no ownership over that message. And so that applies to companies as well. I think, you know, it's not about, um, an intranet. It's not about, you know, Facebook for work. I mean, Facebook, I'm not you know, knocking Facebook for work, but I think what will change for the companies that do this well, um, it's one thing to create the platform. It's another thing to have dedicated community manager or managers actively cultivating, uh, you know, belonging and engagement and community in those spaces. You have to have 
that for it to really stick uh, and be successful. And that's that's the big miss that I think a lot of companies make is they'll say like, oh, well, but we gave you, you know, Facebook for work or, you know, uh, Wiki or whatever. Um, but it's like, you, you can't just build it and hand it to people and be like, okay, now do whatever you want to do on that. <laughs> like you've got to consciously and proactively curate it and cultivate it. Uh, and that's an ongoing thing. So I, I think more companies actually, I see more HR teams. We've talked about mapping HR in the future. I see the role of, a, of an internal community manager being a position that we're going to start seeing more of uh, on HR teams for that very reason. Yeah, no, I I couldn't agree more, and I certainly echo everything you shared on that, and I know that from personal experience as well. So, and um, it is my hope that that um, emerges within organizations to give feelings of certainly uh, inclusion and belonging, but also you know just to deal with uh, you know well being uh, matters and, and you know, get a sense of you know connection, particularly as we're in remote work for the foreseeable future in many cases, because not everyone's going to be coming back to the workplace. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. Now, th there's a question that comes up for Bob, and it probably probably got time for um, one or two more questions, and I'm just going to read it uh, verbatim. As HR evolves, I'm curious to get uh, your thought, uh, Lars, on how new HR roles and whether those roles could or should be filled by non-HR folks with transferable skills and diverse perspectives relevant to evolving talent ecosystems and employee experience. So, you know, people from outside of HR coming into HR, thoughts? Uh, yes, absolutely, and I'm all for it. Um, I think when you look at the field of HR today versus how it was even you know 10 years ago, the field of HR used to be insular. So you'd come up as an associate, you'd move up to a you know, base level, manager, director, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, that career path was typically linear. And if you look at the career today, that's not the case at all. Lots of people are coming into the field from other disciplines. Uh, we have jobs like data scientists that we didn't have 10 years ago. Uh, you know, now that's pretty common. And so you're starting to see as our scope becomes a bit more broad and a bit more complex and multifaceted, we need new skill sets to help us do that. And that influx of talent, that influx of perspectives and experience and training and education and all of that uh, rubs off on all of us. And so it makes us as a field more vibrant, more capable, more dynamic. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, you see this at the CHRO level. You see lots of organizations uh, from, you know, Peloton to VaynerMedia to, you know, Google bringing people in, SpaceX, from other disciplines of the business uh, because they have that business acumen. Uh, and I remember even going back probably in 2018, we did a survey at HR Open Source um, asking our global members um, if any of them, it was, we asked them a range of topics, but one of the questions was, um, have you worked in a discipline outside of HR? And 57% of respondents said yes. So I think that's a great wow. thing for the field. Uh, and I'd love to see more of it. And I think as that continues to increase, uh, our capabilities and our impact and our and that all those go up and our blind spots go away, which I think mm -hmm. is all of that is a, is a huge value for us. Yeah. I, again, I couldn't agree more. Hey, Lars, I think um, we're going to have to wrap, um, unfortunately, because I can talk to you all day about this and I, there's some questions coming in as well. So we're going to have to do this again. Uh, you know, I want to highlight your podcast, a lot of, you know, the ideas that you've, uh, uh, voiced here. I'm sure you elaborate on, you know, there. Uh, for those who are just joining us or who don't know, how can they learn more about you and what you're doing? Um, yeah, the best place is uh, redefininghr.com. Um, I try to keep it easy, especially since I'm doing lots of different <laughs> things. So that's the hub for everything. Podcast, book, accelerator, uh, me, whatever you need, uh, redefininghr.com will point you to what you need. All right, Lars, man. Hey, thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for joining me today. And yeah, again, we're going to have to do this uh, or something like it again really soon. So appreciate oh, you. Hopefully in person soon, buddy. Yeah, before too long, we'll do it. <laughs> All right, be well. <laughs>